What's up, everyone, and welcome into the Buffalo Sports Collective. It is Monday, February 26, 2024. As always, I am PK alongside my co-host, Phil, for episode 262. Phil, I have an important question to ask you before we even dive into the the segments of the show. And I believe I've talked about this a couple times, whether it's on here or Talking Buffalo or wherever I've really talked about it. And I think it is more based on our conversation after the Bandits game yesterday and while I was sitting up in the press box. Has this podcast influenced the way you either watch sports, cheer for sports, cheer for your team, or any of this sort? Because I feel for me, I it has not drastically changed how I watch and analyze and you know, talk about the teams, but I feel like it has definitely made me become not less of a fan, but a different type of fan. Yeah. So it definitely, uh, exactly what you're talking about. We had a a heated ish conversation after the game and there's a huge difference, especially from bouncing back from the press box to back to the fandom. It was a a long time. Yep for me because I think I missed a game because I was sick then they were away then I was in the press box and they were away so I haven't been to a home game as a fan in a little while and it was nice to be back there's definitely a completely different attitude I have toward the game and you know I've, you're a lot more emotionally invested at least I am when I'm a fan when I'm up in the press box it's much more analytical just kind of writing my notes down trying to actually like dissect the game And there's a huge difference um, between the two. I actually wrote that in my notes to bring up, so I'm glad you asked. But, um, yeah, there's a huge difference. Like, when I'm with the fans, I feel like I'm still one of the fans where I still have emotions run high. And there's – I feel like, for the most part, I am more analytical, um, even as a fan. Like, there were the very – beginning of the game when the bandits went on the five on three and had a bunch of really bad penalties like a lot of people were booing at the refs and things and i just was sitting there calmly like well that's what happens when you take really stupid penalties this early in the game stop being dumb and that was more of the calm analytical side of me not the fan side uh but as the game went on and the game got heated and started to slip away and i got more frustrated as a fan um i got more emotional as a fan for sure and even when we're in the press box, it, it takes a lot to not make any cheering or just sit there essentially emotionless because you're supposed to not really be cheering too much or anything. So taking that out of it from the press box standpoint has gotten better. Um, but I definitely see the, the game differently when up there. Sports in general, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I'm still too invested as a fan like you mentioned the super bowl you didn't really care i really didn't want to see casey win because they annoy me but that's again the buffalo bills fan in me and then watching bills games i can watch it a little bit more from a step back and a little bit less i guess reactive and more just analytical and watching it and seeing what's actually going on a little bit better but still a lot of emotion (laughs) involved with a lot of these teams that we cover but there is a huge difference mentally when you're in the press box and watching the game, simply breaking it down and watching it, especially from that vantage point, getting to see everything on the field as it's happening versus what you get to see as a fan and being around the fans that close. There is, there's a big difference in how I view the game and the emotions that go with it. Yeah. I think I'm almost a hundred percent of where you are with the difference between being in the, the media press box and being, you know, in the hundred level amongst the fans, I am the same way where it's, Hey, they got the penalties in the beginning five on three. And my reaction, usually if I was down there amongst the bandit land, it would have been, you know, Hey, you, you can't be doing that kind of stupid penalties. Like, what do you expect? Do you not want the rest to call penalties both ways? Like it was a clear penalty. There was one that we'll talk about that was not a penalty that even in the press box, I'm like, I didn't see it. Like, I am I I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can. I I just didn't see this one. But for the most part it's like, hey, uh, like you can boo the refs. That's part of the excitement. That's part of the experience of being in Bandit Land. That's part of what makes Bandit Land incredible is the pure passion and emotion from the fans. But as 
people who do this type of work of trying to give like the straight facts and then your opinion based on those facts on this show it's it's a little bit different than just being like a diehard fan that you know you follow the team and then when they're home it it's you know, you dress head to toe in black and orange and you're just a part of that banding land but i i've had less of a problem that you're talking about like our first press box experience i know you're like okay we're sitting next to the players maybe i'll be able to feel and <laughs> they'll be able to live it through me because they're showing the emotions and I'm like, I'm perfectly fine. Like if I don't have to stand up and cheer, if I don't have to show emotions, like I feel like I'm good at that in a day-to-day life where I don't have to show pure emotion in very many things. I'm very like even keeled. I never get too high. I never get too low. So just being up in the press box, it's pretty easy for me to just take off the bias hat and just sit there. I was just wondering like your perspective of it as well, because it, for the last almost three years now, it my transition from just a pure fan that wanted to start this podcast and transitioning into more of still a fan, but trying to get more towards the unbiased, just pure facts about the, the game and your opinions on the game without being biased towards one way or the other. It's definitely changed how I view the game and I think that that influenced our conversation after the game which I'm sure we're going to get into with the refs where I was more just like this this is how I feel about it I, I was sitting up here I'm just not seeing what you're seeing Phil like I, I can't I'm I'm maybe I'm wrong I'll rewatch the game but I'm just not seeing what you're seeing and you're like no that's the reason you're not seeing it because you're too unbiased that you'll never blame the ref I was like I We'll, we'll see about that, but we'll dive into it. But yeah, that was my thought is uh, how did this type of experience of doing a podcast plus this season with the Buffalo Bandits being able to and having the great opportunity to be a part of the media up in the box is, and hopefully we're representing the podcast well, but I was wondering how that type of change affected your viewing of sports in general because I know it has definitely changed it for me and I think towards the better in my opinion yeah I mean like I said it I noticed it enough to put it in my notes <laughs> that right it's yeah. uh it's very different like I do think not being in a home game for a little while um I think that also affected it just taking I don't even know how long I hadn't been to one a month or two I think that was a big part of it too. Just like it fueled it a little bit more, almost like a, a mini midseason home opener right. for me. So um, I think that was a big part of it. But yeah, no, I can, I can definitely tell like after my emotions had calmed down and I went back and rewatched the whole game from more of the press box perspective and really trying to break it down. Um, I think my, my opinions have since changed quite a bit, but yeah, you can, you can definitely tell there's a, a massive difference, at least for me, between being a part of the fans and then being more of the analytical podcaster in us that is a little bit more unbiased. But even like you said, over the last few years, seeing the game differently in general, like I can see like my brother and stuff like that, who I sit with and other people like fans that we know that I talk to at the game, they'll be complaining about certain things that they're seeing through a, a fan perspective. And yep. I'll be like, well, that is exactly how it should have happened, because if you watch closely from an unbiased opinion they're playing terrible kind of thing so it is it is different in general like i do think i've shifted more on to an unbiased opinion but still especially in a game like this that was so heated between the two teams there were a lot of moments where even though albany was playing well i just really didn't like them at all with the way that they uh were playing in certain aspects and that was definitely the fan side of me still still raging in there but i do think it's much more I don't know, 60, 40 than it was, you know, when we first started, obviously a hundred zero and then kind of shifting a little bit more to 50, 50 and trying to be more unbiased in the view of the game. Yeah. Two things real quick. Uh, I think this was a good game to have a split up. It, I mean, <laughs> it, it wasn't planned that, Hey, it's Albany. It's going to be a rough house game. Pico what, will be up the been. box and it, it could have been, but, but I think this is a good example of exactly what we're talking about, where it, it's completely different when you're in the fan perspective versus in the, the the podcasting, talking about the game, trying to be unbiased part of it. And then the second part, um, January 6th was the last home game you were in with the crowd. Yeah, so about two months. <laughs> yeah, about uh, close Long to two time. months. Yeah, but we'll dive into the actual show now. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram. 
Threads and TikTok at Buffalo Sports Collective. TikTok, really, we don't make any special videos. It's just whatever reel we came up with that's on Facebook and Instagram. We also put on TikTok just to branch out a little bit more. Maybe someday we'll have one special. Maybe someday. We have some ideas that I think are going to have good TikTok material, but I'm not that savvy, so I'm going to need Producer Pat's help on that one. Uh, X and Blue Sky at Buffalo Sports Co. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel wherever they listen to podcasts. Check out our website at buffalosportscollective.com. Phil's article will be out on Tuesday. My article for the Power Rankings will be out on Thursday. And look for the time breakdowns in the description of the show. We will actually dive into the game that we've been hinting at, Albany versus Bandits. Lost... The Buffalo Bandits did 13 to 10. We saw a goalie goal at the end. So if you left early, I think uh, seeing that vantage point and not really focusing on the fans, but seeing, you know, the actual game itself. And then I took time away and looked at the fans. I was like, man, half the arena left. Uh, You missed three goals. That's about what happened in the final like three minutes. But Byrne had three. Buchanan and Cloutier had two. Nanakoke, McKay, and Frazier won each. Shanahan did start, and we'll talk about that one. 46 of 59 saves. Shots were 59 to 56 in Albany. And for those that still care, 25 to tw- uh, I'm sorry, 25 to two in faceoffs for Albany. Yeah, I think we should start positive. Uh, oh wait, no. I want to. Should we, do we should we finish finish high or start high? Well. F- We'll finish high. All right. I think but we do you want to talk about like all the? Do you want to talk about all the segments. roster moves first before we dive into sure. the actual games? Because there was a ton of. I mean, that's. I mean, that's a whole topic in itself. So sure, we that's will start true. there. Hit it. Hit it up. Yeah. So the injury report came out late Friday, and we put it out, and NLL puts it out, and since NLL is not that transparent, besides like a couple quick notes of here, here's the injury report. We try to do our best to put it out as well, just because I know there's some people that even question us, hey, where did you find this injury report? Where did you find the transactions? And we try to tell them where to find it because we don't want to keep it secretive, even though, you know, that helps us. But try to tell them where on the website you can actually find this stuff. And, you know, Brandon Robinson, Justin Robinson both ruled out immediately. And we're like, okay, that instantly means there's going to be some roster shakeups here. Is Highfield going to get in? What's going on here? But then you saw Nanako get the question mark. He was doubtful the week before. And we're like, okay, seems like Nanako's trending in the right direction. Maybe we'll get him back. And then comes the big news of Matt Vince. Yep, right there. Big questionable tag. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, you never want to see one of your star players, one of the most important pieces on the team, and the best goaltender of all time in this sport, be questionable. Like, a lot of times you see the questionable tag, like Dylan Robinson was questionable last week. He played, no problem. But it, it's that questionable tag where it's it's. it Especially I'm not saying it's like a true, f- right? Like he, I'm I mean, not. Sh- I don't know if we've ever seen him questionable. I don't. It, in the time in Bandits since right. they started this injury report, he's never been on it. Right. But seeing that cue right next to his name, I'm like, okay, maybe he got nicked up in practice. Maybe something happened at the end of the game because they don't really go into details about that. Whatever, don't really care. But you're seeing that, and you're going he's going to play it's questionable if he was doubtful i'd be like okay he's not playing but he's questionable i i see him suiting up and then uh daily dive put out that tweet of matt vince will not be playing and i'm like oh no and i fully trust like fully endorse daily dive go watch them they're they do great work over there but i saw them put it out i'm like oh this is true because he's they've never been wrong about anything they've put out i'm like oh crap this is true all right, it's time to bring up Del- Devlin Shanahan. What's we got? But those are the big moves. You also got uh, Zach Belter back finally. You got Frank Brown back ba- finally. Maybe they're listening to the podcast, and I, this is a joke. It's just a joke for everybody that's not listening. I don't think they actually all listen to the podcast. But we've been talking about it. Are they going to be getting some healthy guys back? They did, and then Highfield played more left forward. But a, a massive change to the actual roster based on all the moves. Christian Watts went back down to practice squad. Carter McKenzie and Emerson Clark didn't play. So it was a f- almost full line change of players inserted and players out and put on the IR. Yeah, I think we'll probably just break down all of them because I had questions about all of them. So we will just get into a star Shanahan. Um, not a great game by any means. I don't think... I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough when you're going for Matt Vince. I know people can consistently complained about him but i feel like it's starting to shift a little bit where more people have had his back more often than not but Shannon didn't yep. play terrible um but did he play like matt vince the the best goalie in the sport of all time no obviously not so 
it's weird, you know, trying to go from somebody who is as great as Vince and then stepping in as, you, as his backup and trying to kind of replicate what he does. You're likely not going to be able to. If Shanahan came out here and played, you know, out of his mind, it'd be something to talk about in that way. But I think he played kind of how you're expecting. Um, I think we were hoping that he would come in and do a little bit better than he did. But I think what you got from a backup goalie is kind of exactly what we should have been expecting and not really what we were hoping for. But I think he had some moments where he made a lot of really good saves. And then he had some moments where you could definitely tell it was his first start in the NLL, even though he's played some time, he's been around. He didn't look great in moments. He was slow in moments, but at other times he made breakaway saves, made some big saves. So it was definitely his first game. Um, it's there, there was news on the broadcast that when I rewatched it, they said that Vince might be out two to four weeks with an upper body injury. So I don't know what you do moving forward with those two with, I mean, obviously they trust Orleman quite a bit as well. That's why he's been, you know, they've rolled with three goalies for a reason, including one on the practice squad. So I think they still view Shanahan or at least before this game, obviously they viewed Shanahan as the number two after this. I don't know. Um, he let in some kind of, I would say simpler shots. Some of a lot of the Kurtz goals were just kind of whipped at the net and he was slightly out of position or just went in. And then the one from, the the power play where it was the behind the back pass and he had no idea where the ball was that's pretty much inexcusable he's a better goalie than that so that one hurt quite a bit but as far as a take a step back look at his whole performance it wasn't the worst it wasn't the best it was pretty much kind of what you expect from a backup trying to step in for Matt Vince yeah pretty much I summed up everything you said I will fully admit once I was leaving that press box I was too hard on Devlin Shanahan because of what you were saying I was basing his performance on what we see from Matt Vince and I'm the first to admit that's not fair whatsoever right. A, right. a younger player who's 24 years old in his first start against a very good Albany team it's not fair to compare him to the greatest of all time 278 games in the league top records all over the place straight seasons he hasn't missed yeah. A, a game <laughs> yeah he hasn't not dressed for like since 2008 or 2007 or something, or something like that something it's like ridiculous that. It was, yeah absolutely ridiculous the streak he was on but it, it, even jt was like yeah mad vince didn't know what to do because he wasn't even dressed in this one but i do agree there were times there where you saw devlin shanahan's you know, younger self and a guy who doesn't have very many minutes in the NLL. He's been in the NLL since 2019, I believe it was, when he was drafted. But he hasn't really played a ton of minutes. But I think you saw flashes of what the Buffalo Bandits see in him when Matt Vince does go off into the sunset. And I believe there are just moments in that game, like you said, he loses track of where the ball is. I think that improves as he gets minutes. And those shots that you were talking about from the point, I, those are saves that a routine goalie will make. But you know, when did he find out he was going to be playing this game? Like, was it Saturday morning? Was it earlier in the week? Were they pl like practicing with him as the 1A goalie? Or was this more of a last-minute change? That's stuff that we don't know. So it, how was his headspace going into the game? I thought early in the game they were getting shots on him that he was able to make those early saves. And I'm like, okay. He's going to get in this rhythm. This is a good thing for him to see the ball, make the saves, just saying, hey, it's another game. I do this in the summer all the time. I can make these saves. But then as the game goes on, you're kind of noticing this isn't Mad Vince, and there isn't another Mad Vince, and you kind of have to twist your opinion on, okay, this is how other teams perform when they don't have the greatest goaltender of all time in between the pipes that you can rely on. And... You know, we'll transition to the defense and the forwards and everything yeah, in a minute. Quick. But oh, okay, yeah. sorry. No, if you're still going on Shanahan, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still on Shanahan. But, like, I, I don't believe that he is the reason that the Buffalo Bandits lost this one. I don't even think he's in the top five. Uh, but I, I believe that, you know, there is a promising future from what we saw in Devlin Shanahan. I think he can be a good goaltender in this league. Will he be one of the top? players in the league in the net I don't think so but I've been proven wrong before but I think he can be a very reliable piece to a playoff and possible title contending team if he's needed to in the future and like you said Mad Vince two to four weeks I'm not that mad that the next opponent will be Vancouver if he's between the pipes 
So two things there. You said he wasn't top five in your reasons they lost, but we kind of talked about it. If Matt Vince was in, do we think they win? I think there's a chance that if Vince was between the pipes, I, they win. So, I mean, again, I, is Shanahan the sole reason or no? Um, but I think he, if you have Vince in, I, I think you have a, a shot at winning this where Shanahan, while playing really well and the offense, which we will get to, is a bigger concern. I think he just, he did what you expect, but not quite enough. But again, you're playing a really good offense. But I do agree completely. If Matt Vince is in between the pipes, I think you do walk out victorious, but I don't. Bl- that's still comparing Devlin right. Shanahan to Matt Vince. That's, that's my that's thought. What, yeah, that's yeah that's why I have Shanahan outside of the top five of people that you can blame and things that you can blame for the loss in this one. I do believe that if Matt Vince is between the pipes with the performance that we saw in front of him, I think you win a right. low scoring game, like an eight seven game or something like that, because I believe he will make those saves and he won't lose the ball. But I can't put the loss anywhere right. near Devlin Shanahan right. because he played well enough for this team to win, in my gotcha. opinion. And then moving forward, if it is, we'll say it's even two weeks. Do you think, A, there, there's two schools of thought of this. One, now Shanahan has tape on him. And from what we saw, which, again, is something that he can also adjust to himself, just playing maybe in his second start, that he was a little bit slow side to side. Uh, and just kind of some of his reactions seemed a little bit slow. He seems more of a... Nick Rowe style goalie or Dylan Ward style goalie where he sits in the net, doesn't really have a lot of huge movements. I noticed like that too. Yep. Vince is all over the place, which is fine. Vince is obviously the one of the best to do it. There's multiple ways to play goalies. Some sit, you know, pretty deep in the net and just kind of really hold their angle. And that's how they play without making too many movements. But then you have a player like Vince, who's very active and moving all over. So do you think with more tape on him, they switch to Orleman and in general, do you think they should switch to Orlman while Vince is out and just see what they have in each of these goalies? Because now nobody really has, obviously, current tape on Orlman either. So do you think just to throw off the opponent, they switch to Orlman not only to see what Orlman is, but also just to make sure that they're kind of mixing it up on the team that they're playing next? Immediately after the game, my answer would have been yes. But after taking some time reviewing everything, going over the notes and everything, I think they believe, and I, I'm with them, I think Devin, Devlin Shanahan is the better of the two. And just based on, I mean, he's been the backup for how many years? He's he's like, yeah, I think Ian McKay even mentioned it. Like, he's taking the extra shots after practice. He's missing the meals and late to the meals because he's taking the extra, pra- the extra right. shots in practice. He deserves this opportunity. I don't think he did anything in this game to warrant seeing what you have in Orleman, especially because you're sitting at five and five. Now you want to go with the player that you have more confidence in. I have more confidence in Shanahan. I believe the team does. The only other thing I have on him. And then if there's anything else you have on Shanahan, the biggest thing is better, you know, rebound control as well, because there were some big juicy rebounds coming off of him that again, I'm used to seeing Mad Vince be able to pinch those off and keep them contained. But if he can able to track the ball better and be able to control more of those rebound shots, I think you see a much better and a a bigger difference between what you saw in start one versus start two for Devlin Shanahan. Yeah, and especially with, again, he's going to learn from this as well. Um, 100%. Obviously, it's his first NLL start. That's a very big thing. I know like people will see that he's been in the league for a while, but he's been a backup, obviously getting your first start and actual minutes in a game is very different. He plays over summer, so it's not like he's not getting play time as a starting goalie, but still, it's a very different feeling. So he will, like you mentioned as well, he's only 24, so he'll learn from this. He'll go study his own tape, figure out what he needs to do better. And I think we do see a more improved Shanahan in game two. But also with that, if they do continue to roll with Shanahan, and especially which kind of transitions to the next point, how long do you think they continue to roll three active goalies on the roster obviously right now Vince is out so they don't have to but when Vince comes back and all these extra players you have now activated off of injury there's going to be a huge roster crunch coming up which is a big talking point from this game do you think they continue to roll three do you think they try to trade Orlman if they really believe in Shanahan and then you have Constantinopolis as your um your practice squad goalie to possibly call up in an extreme pinch if you really needed to, or do you think they just continue to roll three active goalies and one on the practice squad? Uh, I think a lot of it is like a moving pendulum. I, I, 
it, it depends on now the health of these guys. A lot of players. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think without knowing much, I right. think Frank Brown and Zach Belter were ready to go a while ago. Again, no knowledge of any of this. This is all speculation on my part. I think they've been ready to go for a while, but they haven't been able to make a roster move because they've just played the whole season pretty much healthy. Right. And then this wave of injuries came and they were like, okay, now we can bring them back. The issue is when the Robinsons are back and Matt Vince is back, what do you do with the roster crunch you're in? So I do think that the time has come when all these players come back that you have to make a decision. You can't be carrying four ro- goalies on a 25 man roster. It doesn't happen, especially when you're sitting at five and five. If you were sitting at eight and two right now, it'd be a different story. Right. But now you're fighting for a playoff spot. It's time to buckle down, and you can't be doing what the Sabres have been doing or did to start the season is carrying three goalies. It's not a logical way to you know, win games. And uh, I'm not saying that this is another reason, but in practice, when you have four goalies, how much time is Shanahan and Orleman truly getting in a shared net behind Matt Vince? Like, if there was only the three goalies on the roster, does Stelvin Shanahan get more opportunities in practice, and is he able to take that next step further? I'm not saying it's it, it, it happens because it's practice, but I think, to answer your question, I think once... <laughs> Once the roster crunch happens, you have to make a moving goal, moving goal. whether it's trading Orleman, trying to get him down to the practice squad, something. But I think it's time to, you know, even if you scratch him and it's a healthy scratch and then you only got one other guy, you know, you're not really carrying three full-time active roster goalies, even though you technically are, but they're not dressed for the game. So I think once the roster crunch happens, which I have no idea when it's going to happen, right, how serious are these injuries? The Robinsons. Right. Um, I, I think it will be time to make a decision because having four goalies over three is a big difference when it comes time to, okay, which player are you either moving out or getting the chop block because there's just not enough room on this team, which we've been saying for three years. <laughs> and now we can move on to the rest of the roster crunch, which is Belter, Brown, and Highfield. I thought Belter and Brown played really well. I thought Belter in his first game ever as a rookie played extremely well. Uh, I thought thought he was was one of the best players out there. He was very physical. He played it legally, which is great to see. Yep, 100%. (laughs) uh, There were a few times he might have gotten away with something. Found the line, didn't cross it. But I thought he played really well. He was very physical. He were not moving him, which was great to see. He was very hustle oriented and i don't know if you saw it did you rewatch the game at all yet or no sorry i have not been able to i was Um, out until like two in the morning yeah so i saw it live and then went back and watched it did you see his diving shot block yes where he so he got beat by the player and then knew we got beat sprinted back into the play and literally full out dove and was able to get his stick in the way of the shot which is incredible given how small the sticks are compared to the ball but he laid out to get a shot block and was able to block a shot from dead center that I don't know, I can say likely would have gone in, but had a good shot to go in because it was a very well positioned shot right down the middle. No one blocking it pretty close in. And he was just laid out and was able to block it. I mean, just the hustle and effort he showed was incredible. Brown, I thought played fine. He had a couple too many penalties than I would like to see, but overall he didn't I don't think he played poorly by any means in his first game back in a long time. I thought he played pretty well. And then Highfield played a lot on offense. He wasn't super noticeable, but in his first game, especially with that kind of offense, he the shifts he did have, I thought he did play well, and he didn't make any glaringly obvious mistakes. So I thought that looked good, and he had a few pretty good opportunities and a few good shots. So he didn't do anything to, I think, hurt the view of him by any means. He didn't play amazing where he scored a goal or anything but I thought he played pretty well given his you know limited time with the team the turnover really quickly obviously didn't have much time to practice or anything so just being kind of was it feet to the fire thrown out there I think he played pretty well in his first game yeah I mean congrats to Frank Brown coming back after what a year and a half of not playing in the NLL I think I saw the last time he played was the finals of 2022 so credit to him for busting his butt and getting back I thought he was a nice addition to the defensive side of the ball. Again, taking too many penalties, and we'll dive into that in a second. But I, I thought Belter was one of the best players out there, and I know we've been calling for him to get some action for a while now. But, I mean, he's a big-bodied defender, 
physically aggressive back there. He's exactly what this defense needed. And he was doing it all legally. Like you said, he was not taking those dumb penalties. It was all effort out there. I mean, it was full guns ablazing the whole time he was playing. But I thought to do a collective, because two of these guys are on the defensive end, I thought the defense in general played a really, really good game. I know there was a bunch of penalties on them that we'll talk about in a minute, but I thought for a whole collective, I thought this was one of their best defensive performances that we've seen in a very long time. And the issue with why they still gave up, quote unquote, gave up 13 goals is because of how much time they were out there. No, that's not a shot at the face off dot. Don't even start with me. It's the best, the penalties. They were on the penalty kill for so long. And you got guys like Weiss, you got guys like Wires and Justin Martin and Steve Priolo who are out there on the penalty kill and that it's killing their bodies and they're breaking down as the game goes on. And I, and I think that's something that we haven't talked about enough was they haven't had enough reliable guys that they can trust on the penalty kill, and it's all their top guys. So as the game goes on, they're all broken and battered because you're taking too many penalties, and that's the reason you're giving up so many goals. And I'm not talking about the penalty kill just yet and the power plays and the penalties and everything, but as a collective, I thought the defense played really, really well. Were there some breakdowns? Yes, but there's some breakdowns in every game. Were there as many breakdowns as we've seen on this horrible, horrible stretch? Not even close. And I think some of the reason that Delvin Shanahan played as well as he did in the net for his first opportunity is because of the players in front of him. I thought 13 caused turnovers, unbelievable in this game. I, I really think the defensive effort, again, was good enough to get them the victory. I absolutely loved what I saw out of them. And if you see this performance and this effort from the defense the rest of the season, I think you make playoffs. And I, I think you have a very good chance at going far in the playoffs if you get this type of performance from your defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I only had, and I cannot, physically remember what they were even though I've rewatched the game quite a bit I had three goals that were inside on Shanahan and really there weren't too many one was opportunities on what was that one was on Solver he didn't play the body he didn't play the man coming off the bench then the ball went to him and he didn't go far enough out on him and that was one of the results that was one of the goals that I had on the defense not just because I thought Solver's played unbelievable this season but I thought that was one of the the chances that shouldn't have happened because the defense not get too lackadaisical but didn't play the right style of defense for that situation yeah and one of the goals I had was inside was the power play behind the back yep. kind of one I think another one was on the power play so even the ones that were right inside in the middle, yep. that I had were just because it was on power plays five on three yep. where the guy's literally shooting from you know the crease because it's a power play and that's kind of just what happens you're allowed to get in that close I mean you shouldn't be but it happens on the power play so most of the inside goals, I think they were able to score, I think were predominantly on the power play so or penalty kill for the Bandits. So outside of that, I thought the Bandits did an extremely good job forcing yep. Albany to the outside. There were not too many opportunities where they got in close on Shanahan, had that one-on-one -on -one easy opportunity or even that you know crease dive flying around. Like They really forced them to the outside. I had five goals that were mid-range on Shanahan and three from the far outside. They were on Shanahan, and again, most of the inside ones were power play. So I thought they played really well. And I know you mentioned, so I don't want to steal your thunder, but you mentioned that you heard McKay said that they switched up their defensive system midweek, yes. and they yep. came out with this. And I don't know if having Belter and Brown out there as well adjusted anything, but if they did switch their system and, you know, the addition of Belter helped out, I mean – Whatever this new system-ish is, it, it looked really, really good. And honestly, they played really well. And I think the defense for the first time in, what, five, six games was not the reason you lost. Well, Agreed. But is is there anything else aside, you, but we'll get to that. Is there anything else you want to add to the defensive side of the ball? No. No, I don't think so. Okay. Let's get into our sponsory because we're about midway through the show before we dive into the actual forward part of it and then a couple more aspects of this game because we're about like 35, game. 34 minutes in. So, <laughs> Phil, uh, take it away with our sponsor, Ad Read, for uh, four four times now. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm excited this to have number four. four tap that shows. tap room at 363 Delaware Street in Tonawana, New York, still. Our first sponsor, they are Buffalo's first women-owned self-pour bar. If you don't know what that is, it is a bar where they have 30 consistently rotating taps. You go up and pour it yourself. You can choose as little or as much of whatever you want there. They even have things as basic as, you know, Labatt Blue. If you're if you're into something where you just want to go there and you know, I don't want anything fancy, I just want to drink 
what I, I know and love. They do have that, but they also offer a variety of beer, cider, sour, seltzers, and malt beverages. We have not had the chance to enjoy the patio yet, even though it is uh, sunny outside and a little bit warmer today. It is still only 35 degrees. We're still in February. It's not quite close to patio season yet, but we are getting closer. Yeah, and they give away tickets to home Bandits games when you go there to watch the away games. I'm not committing to it, but there has been whispers that a few of us might be back in attendance for Saturday's game. So uh, we'll keep you tuned if we fine-tune it and we finally do it. Um, We might be back. We might be back this next away game when they face Vancouver. But let's dive back into it. Let's talk about the forward group now, and we'll try to speed this talking point up because we're, we're... beating this game to death forwards um what happened man like 10 goals after averaging what close to 14 15 goals a game in the the last stretch here since the the colorado game it just dried up they went where i had it here where is it they went 22 minutes and 48 seconds without a goal that that's that happened it's unbelievable and this is not the first time this offense has kind of gone through this stretch but I thought they kind of buried that aspect of it 10 shots in the third quarter not acceptable these these no goal runs third quarter zero goals one goal in the fourth quarter when it actually mattered like they were down four and they were trying to come back and you can say those goals actually matter because they were trying to fight back but when you're down four with like what three minutes to go the chances of coming back are very very slim it's they they went a full half pretty much with two goals that have tried to make an effort. And even the Josh Byrne one, you were down three goals. You're down four goals, something like that. It's just this offense kind of disappeared. And I'm I'm I I not started to question everything because how can you question a team that had just unbelievable? But these these runs that you're just not scoring. And I know being on the penalty kill affected a few of these and one of them was a shorthanded goal by Byrne. But it's just I, I'm questioning with the amount of talent that was there and everybody was healthy besides Brandon Robinson. What happened? Like, is Brandon Robinson really this big of a key? Because when he was out that one game, they didn't perform as well, I believe, because he was on the back end and it was McCulley up top. But it's just I, I don't know what happened to this offense, Phil. I, I really don't. Yeah, and we love to say that it's a game of runs and the Bandits, the best they could do was two in a row, which uh, is not going to help. That's what happened in game one, too. Like, I know, not not to cut you off, but I know Buchanan was talking about it where Albany plays a different style than the rest of the league does. And maybe, I said this earlier, maybe Albany is just Buffalo's kryptonite because they've beaten them three of four times in the last two years. And not, I mean... These two games, I mean, yes, they were. This one ended yeah, up being kind of close, yeah. but yeah, it's. I mean, they're they're pretty much just whooping them. And honestly, to me, like the and maybe it is the style of defense they play. Maybe Jameson forces them to do things that are different. But I thought what Albany did on defense wasn't as important as what the Bandits were not doing on offense. Agreed. And maybe yep. part of it is simply how they play defense, and it's not something I'm trained enough to see. But the Bandits' offense just looked off they looked just bad i mean the the passes were all over the place being dropped all over the place the shots were all over the place as well i mean most of the shots or not most of but some of the shots they missed were so bad that would just end up in the seats and you're immediately you know ruining that opportunity to score they just weren't hitting the net they hit a ton of posts so i mean yes if you take those posts away and they are goals i honestly i think they hit four or five posts so were they close sometimes and if those go in you're looking at a much different game sure they had moments where they looked really good but for the most part they just looked off like the the passes were just not there the shots were just not very good they weren't finding a way inside pretty much ever um i only had two goals against jameson that were inside one of them was cloutier's incredible behind the net dunk that he was able to get. And for the most part, they weren't able to get inside. And maybe, like you said, maybe that's a lot of not having Robinson out there. Maybe he just needs to be that bulldog kind of guy. I thought Nanakoke looked okay, but you could definitely tell it was his first game back from an injury. He did not look 100%. I mean, I don't think he played bad, but you could tell he just wasn't his usual self. I know there was a penalty kill where he had like three guys on him. He was able to hold the ball. So it isn't an anti Nanako thing by any means he did play really well but you could tell he was not 100 percent. he just wasn't out there as much when he was out there he wasn't quite he just looked hesitant is the biggest thing he just wasn't his usual running through everybody kind of play style he just looked like he was a little bit hesitant so he might just not have been 
a hundred percent. So the offense just looked off. And in a game where the defense finally showed up, even with Shanahan, you know, not playing amazing, I think the defense and Shanahan did enough to give the offense a chance to win. And the offense did not back them up. And it's hard to take away much from the offense. I, I do agree that they just disappear a little bit too much and go on these just dry spells way too often. They need to play more consistently throughout the game, but for an offense that was, you know, top three in the entire league and had put up an insane amount of goals very consistently before this game. It's very hard to harp on them. The one time the defense shows up that it's their fault. They lost. It's true, but it's really hard to get down on the offense that is playing so, so well outside of this game. So I do think they had a bad game. I don't know. Again, maybe it is whatever Albany system is on defense. It really does just throw them off for some reason, but I thought they did not play very well, and I, I do expect them to rebound because this offense is very talented, and they've shown it most of the season. Yeah, I don't have much else to add to this. I think it was just a bad game. It was a very it was. sloppy game. It wasn't I know a good game to be Ferris, a bad game. <laughs> yeah, and I know John Tavares mentioned a couple times that Buchanan also mentioned it. If you can get a certain shot at 25 seconds left in the shot clock, you can get the same shot with five seconds left in the shot clock. So he was mentioning, you know, better shot opportunities, better time of possession because to give your defensive side of the ball that's a, another a part, bit of a sorry break. To cut you off, but that's another part of yeah. the defense that I wanted to mention yep. earlier. Like they were, the offense was running in there, taking a wild shot yep. within the first like three seconds of the shot clock. And the defense is right back out there because you turned it over. And that happened multiple times throughout the game. So that also doesn't help your defense when they're like, all right, we yep. finally got a kill. That's great. And your offense just sprints down there, takes a wild shot. It ends up out of play. And you're like, okay, we're back on defense. Lovely. Yeah. I, the only other thing I got to add, and I guess it's slightly negative, is Dane Smith's got to get whatever kind of monkeys on his oh back gosh. off. Because score, we love you. Uh, 11 you shots on no goals. Something's up with the shooting for he's still putting up great amount of points like he's, he's still fine. the central he's piece he's not playing bad like right. whatsoever still it's just he's still the best play, one of the best players in the entire league but it's just something's up with the goal scoring like i don't know if this is just one of those off years but he's just not getting the ball past the goalies or what's going on but i'm not even saying they need him to score three to four times a game to win these games because we've seen them put up numbers without him scoring and what he's brought to this team and facilitating and be the playmaker on this team and getting goals for the other guys. But eventually we got to see a game where he's putting up three or four goals just so for my own feeling that I know he can still do it. But or Phil, not, uh, like I think he just has to continue, which is unfortunate, but like he's just got to take a step back as far as shooting or just goes. get to the dirty areas too. Right. If he can get to the dirty areas and score one of those dirty goals, maybe that early in the game too, maybe that'll, yeah, because he had more, one but... last game where he had a huge yep. fake and then was able to get in. And even the announcer yep. said, like, it's only a goal that Dane Smith would see. So he's got yep. it. He's fine. We're not we're not panicking. It's not an anti-Dane Smith anything by any means. But 11 shots, no goals does does not help. And this is my face off take. And this is all I will say. I've been saying it since we started this podcast. It's not about winning or losing the draw. It's what happens immediately after it. And Kyle Buchanan, who is one of the best players on this team, said it himself. Ian McKay is causing enough loose balls to win these face-offs, and they've been being too hesitant on the face-offs to go get that ball. How many times did you see a scrum and then Albany comes out with it? It's not about winning it clean or winning it. I don't remember how many times in this game that Nardella won it truly clean. It wasn't very many. It was a lot of scraps, and Albany was just picking up the ball. He said they need to be more aggressive at the face-off that to try to go get those loose balls that Ian McKay is drawing. If you do that, it's a lot more even. And that's all I care about. I, two goals transpired immediately off the faceoff on that next possession. Two out of the 13 play. goals that were scored. So calm down. Faceoffs only matter in those crunch times when you need to win it to get the ball. Otherwise, there is no correlation between winning faceoffs and winning the game. Trevor Baptiste was the best faceoff man in the world when he was in Philly. And Philly stunk. And he was 0-4 in the playoffs. Face-off wins and wins do not correlate. It, it's not possible, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm, I don't think I'm going to bring up face-offs anymore because I'm tired of it. I, like, I'm done with it. I, I don't care about other people's opinions. I'm standing firm on it, and this might be the only time I'm actually firmly admitting. I'm right on this one. I'm fully right on it that face-offs do not matter. It's what happens immediately after the face-off draw. 
And then with what Buchanan said, and I have not been paying close enough attention. Do you know? Because it doesn't matter. Are they doing three and one still? With the, it's been it's been back and forth, three and one, two and two. Like they've been trying two different and things. Two and obviously that's going to be more of what Buchanan's looking for. If there's a scrum and it, you know, they're able to at least get it to Albany's side, and it's you know two guys versus one down there. Obviously, you're not often going to win those, but if you split up the two and two and there's a scrum you have a much better chance of winning that loose ball so i wonder if there'll ever be a switch of that and maybe it'll come when it's not a face-off specialist like nardella or withers who's one of the best in the game but maybe when it's a little bit more even like this upcoming game maybe they'll see a lot more two on two and maybe they're just like you said maybe they're just too hesitant to go in when there's a true face-off guy they're just too scared to give that opportunity up and they just want to make sure they're ready for defense. So maybe moving forward, they'll be a little bit more aggressive, but in general, whether it's a good face off guy outside of maybe withers, maybe if it's a good face off guy or not, they just need to be more aggressive on them. Yeah. Well, the benefit, no more Baptiste, no more withers. I think you got right. Erling coming up, but I, I don't, I think you pretty much run through the gauntlet already, but Phil, I don't know. I, we haven't really talked about this subject. Is there anything else that you want to talk about this game? Um, let me look at my notes. I know the the over. only big thing is like the refs and the penalties. Buffalo, it's the one bad penalty that I think that was called on Buffalo that shouldn't have been was the Nick Weiss cross checking. I didn't see it. Like I I'm I'm trying to find it and I didn't see it at all. I thought that was the one bad call. And for those that have been complaining, and this is a shot of you, Phil, about the the checking from behind. The, the reason that they're getting called for it is because when Buffalo does it, they got two hands on the stick and they're cross-checking them from behind. If you saw it late in the game, Ian McKay got pushed from behind, but guess what? Albany's player had one hand on the stick, one hand on McKay's back, and nudged him back. You don't have to check them from behind to cause them to get out of the play. An easy slight push from behind will do just the damage. Like, I had zero problems with the refs last night. For those that have been calling for the ref's head, you know, whatever. That's your own opinion. I'm not touching the refs. I rarely ever criticize the refs because they they rarely make or break a game. And in this game, it was Buffalo's undisciplined attitude, in my opinion. And yes, if you want to say in those scrums, Albany might not have gotten the same amount of penalties. But guess what? You're going to get, it's the true statement. And it happens in hockey. My dad has said this my whole life. The first man who causes it is not getting the penalty. It's going to be the second guy that follows through, and that's what Buffalo was doing all day, and this is what happened in Game 1 versus Albany is Albany was able to get under their skin, and Buffalo lost their cool. Same thing happened in this one. I put it in my notes. Buffalo has to calm the stinking down because they're going to get in foul trouble, and 4-8 and eight on the power play for Albany. Buffalo was 0-1, and I know two of them were on delayed penalties. Buffalo would have gotten the power play, but they scored on it. But... Dude, like you're you're professional athletes, you shouldn't be able to have these guys get under your skin so easily that it happens back to back games. And I believe it happened last year as well. Like I don't know what Albany says or does that gets under Buffalo's skin so easily. All right, so clearly we've moved into the refs. Um That's what I was wondering if you want to talk about or not. <laughs> well you you started it. <laughs> um I do think that's really next on my notes. I think I pretty much have well, I mean, are we looping special teams into this as well i assume yeah yeah we can loop in this because it's all one collective special teams but as far as like going back like you said when i was uh a little bit calmer and not just frustrated with the loss i did go back and watch it very carefully it's probably the closest i've watched a game because i was trying to watch literally every single player on the field to see if anything was missed um there's only two i think out of the 12 calls against the bandits, I had 10 and a half that were good. Um, the two that I didn't like exactly, like you said, the Weiss one. The, so the only thing with the Weiss one I could possibly think of, which is very unfair and not what you should do. There was a play right call? before that. Yep. Make up where call. Yep. Weiss was very violent. He went over the top. There was no call. And then in the very next play, they call Weiss for something that was absolutely not yep, there. I've seen it was before, a cross yep. check and he didn't, I think he only had one hand on his stick there was no cross-checking motion like it's just it's not there so the only thing i can think of was it was a makeup call for the play before it but you can't you can't do that if you're a ref you missed it you missed it again this isn't full against the refs for the most part 10 and a half out of 12 i thought were good the only other one that i didn't love was late in the game frank brown checking from behind i really don't think he really hit him uh pretty much at all i think the motion was there ish but again the player take was your second hand off the stick 
Right. Like, the player was running away from Brown and just kind of, like, got a light nudge and fell. Like, I, I don't think it should have been a penalty by any means. But, like you said, they were calling it all game. I do think Albany has learned how to fall down really easily, and that's not necessarily saying that they're diving. I think they feel the stick on their back and then fall down, and I think half the time they got the call, half the time they didn't. So sometimes it didn't work, and the ref was like, whatever, I'm just going to let that go, and other times it did work. But it's a good way to play if the refs are calling it and the vein yep. have to learn that if it's being called, knock it off. I mean, again, out of 12 calls, the only other one that I had an issue with, and this is – uh, ticky tacky i guess if you want to say it. it's not really it wasn't anything that was called against the bandits but watkinson going after martin i thought he deserved instigating for that fight i thought oh that was jt brought that up too like garbage. he was ragged down on justin martin justin martin's one of the smallest players on yeah. this team and he was like martin the, was standing still 100 percent not involved yes. in anything and watkinson comes flying in from half checks him in the back grabs his face and starts a fight you got to call Agreed. that. I'm yep. sorry. You yep. you have to call 100%. that instigating. That was garbage to make that an even fighting penalty when Martin had no interest in fighting a guy that's twice his size. Obviously, Martin. He not pulled him be, to the ground too. Like the refs need to get it involved just, in there too, because I know they got back to their feet. But Martin wanted no right. to deal with that. Like he wasn't. His gloves well. were still on. Like yeah. it, that. I agree with that. Like I, I did miss that one. That one needs to be an instigator. And JT even mentioned in the press conference that was one of the ones where I was like, yeah, that one should have been called. You need to be able to protect these guys. Where Mar- Martin had no involvement in that play whatsoever. He's scooping up the loose ball and then he's in the middle of a fight. So yeah, I completely agree. Uh, that that should have been called but again like two bad calls then oh yeah no it's not again didn't change the game like you said going back and looking at it this game wasn't really on the refs at all again albany knew welcome to my side what was that welcome to my side phil it's nice to have you i don't think they were flawless by any means but were they yes they never lost no um and again like you mentioned the zero for one for the power play realistically it's two for three because they're delayed yep. calls that weren't ended up being called because they scored. So bandits were closer to two for three on the power play. It doesn't necessarily count, but the bandits knew what was being called and they continued to yep. do it. Priolo. What? I, I don't, and like you mentioned, like this he was is, so good all year. He was so good. What happened? He's making up for it all in team. one like, game. What, like you mentioned, what is it with Albany? Like why, other than the fact that they're young and they're small, I don't like, I feel like because they're, smaller forwards you just think you can bully them but like the one scrap that they had really early on was all bandits the albany didn't do anything like none of their players fought none of them pushed back and then the bandits were just punching and throwing and hitting and like why what what is it in priola like you mentioned so good all year and all of a sudden he's got a cross checking a dead ball follow a cross checking like and they were all very obvious penalties like what yep what is it like i don't i don't get it like even the first five on three that Albany had. It was just all Buffalo. Like, what are you doing? I just don't, what is it about Albany? Uh, like that, that really just throws you off that much. Like you're supposed to be the champions. You're supposed to be the better team because you simply have more talent play like it. I, I don't know why they're so incredibly aggressive. Just calm down and play the game. Like it's just, I don't know, like Albany absolutely learned how to lean into that kind of aggression and Buffalo just eats it up. <laughs> yep, they played right into their hand, but we can kind of terrible. calm this one down because we're 53 minutes in. Uh, well, we're not calm. Yeah, we're not coming, but it's it, they're sitting at five and five. They got Vancouver coming up this week, and it's a must win. We mentioned that they've lost their series against Albany. They've lost their series against Halifax, you know, uh, Georgia, New York. Most of the they, they've teams. lost. A, <laughs> you, they've lost so many head-to-head matchups where they have to go on some type of run here. I don't remember last time Buffalo's lost five five games. It, it might have been the draft that they landed. Josh Byrne alone in it, the first 10 games. Yeah, it's it's not it's a weird good place to be. right now. I still think they're a playoff team, but they have to get this together. It's they a must to win up. in Vancouver. You can't fall below 500. So let's move on to the milestones real quick. Only two of them happen. Again, you can follow all these possible milestones at Buffalo Sports Co. on X. We post them on the lead up to every game. Dane Smith got three cause turnovers, so not only did he tie Mitch jo- or Mitch Desnew, for fourth place in Buffalo Bandits history. It is his. So thank you, Dane Smith. Back-to-back weeks, I can cross that off my milestone. Then the second one, Ian McKay, he did pass Darius Kilgore for eighth place in Buffalo Bandits history in face-off attempts. Yeah, Dane, I think they mentioned on the broadcast as well, was playing a lot of defense in this game. I don't know it paid if off, that's yeah. simply because 
they were down defenders and obviously you had Brown and Belzer both coming back. So obviously you want to kind of ease them in. Not just Didn't help half in. your penalty kill players were in the box. Too, that is though. true. Most of them were, were yeah. in the box, some three at a time. So Dane Smith was kind of forced to play the evens, but I thought he played pretty well. Um, kind of stepping back there a little bit more than he's used to. I think he handled it pretty well. And like you mentioned, two cost turnovers, not bad. Yeah, it's off the board now. So probably not going to have to talk about cost turnovers for Dean Smith in a while. But uh, we'll go to the NLL lookout. We'll try to fly through these because, again, we're running long because that game. Uh, New York versus Colorado. Colorado, unbelievable. 18-10 to 10 win. 12-2 to 2 in the second half by Colorado. Just smoked New York in the second half. Georgia fell to San Diego in overtime 12 to 11. San Diego is on a hot streak and they're still in tier 1 of teams. Las Vegas was able to knock off Rochester 12 to 8 with a 4 nothing run in the fourth quarter by Vegas. Following that one, Vancouver and Toronto, very low scoring game, 2 to 2 at half, 7 to 3 for Toronto in the second half and they took this one 9 to 5. Yes, five goals, Nick Rose. Unbelievable. Halifax just utterly ragdolled Saskatchewan 19 to 6. Great win by them. And then Calgary gets back to 500 with a 14-11 win over Philly. We do not have the results of Georgia Panther City, Panther City yet because they play at 4 o'clock, and it is about noon on Sunday. Yeah, Halifax is looking scarier and scarier. Um, Big time. I had them as a top team, and it looks like they're going to be a top team. I'm Bandits. patting you on the back. Don't worry. I'm patting you on the back. But who is your top team? Buffalo. What, right now? Yeah. No, uh, in the – Oh yeah, no. The bandits are yeah. really falling yeah, from falling uh, the top yeah. team. That they're they're hurting that. But um, I gave you a positive, but I had to knock you down. I got to bring it back that's even. Fair. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> I have three of the top four. I have that are supposed to be three of the top four. So I'm, yeah, I'm almost there. Albany is. Really it's good odds. That's out. passing. That is yeah, passing. Seventy five percent. But as far Seas as standings degrees. go, the bandits are sitting six, so they're still in a playoff spot. They're not really looking terrible, but they really got to go on a massive run at the end of the season here to really try to just get some space from the rest of the pack. Everybody else is pretty much on their butts. I mean, for the most part, let's see, the most amount of losses in the entire league is eight with Vancouver. They're pretty much toast, but everyone else, I mean, do I expect other teams to go on runs that can match the bandits or catch up to them? No, but I mean, most of these teams have six or five losses and that's what the bandits are sitting at. So not in a safe place by any means. Currently, you're in a playoff position, which is great, but you got to start stringing a lot of wins together, and you got to start playing like the championship team that you have the talent to be. Yeah, I mean, Albany, Toronto sitting at 8-2. and two. San Diego, seven wins. Halifax, seven wins. Georgia sitting at six currently as we're recording. Then Calgary's back at 5-5. Five and five. You got... New York five and six, they got the the edge over you. Colorado sitting at four and seven. It's it's still a cluster, and Buffalo went from above the cluster to in the cluster now, and that is not good. But some big time matchups, big time games, big time upsets in week thirteen of the NLL. We'll bring you week fourteen in the the power rankings, and on Thursday our BSC picks come out on Wednesday, and then we'll talk more about what's happening in week 14 on the next show. We'll dive into our final segment, 58 minutes into the show. <laughs> Buffalo Sabres, they won. Two in a row. Congrats to them. Friday, Columbus, 2-1 to one victory. Gergensen and Clifton were the goal scorers. UPL 25-26 of 26 saves. Shots were 37-26 to 26 in favor of Buffalo. Like I said, Phil, two-game winning streak. Here we go. Oh, it'll all come crashing down against Carolina Hurricanes. 100%. Uh, they have a game on Sunday. After we record, they're going to lose it. You're not winning that one. Um, no, they can't win three games in a row. It's not possible. No, it's it's, it's not allowed. I mean, so it's far, not in their it's, contract. It's physically. Yeah, it's not the contract. Buffalo just is not, not allowed. Not allowed. They have to take yeah, this sorry. one. I mean, if you're betting, I, I mean, you could put probably your entire life savings on the Buffalo Sabres losing this game. and you'd We do not advise this. Crazy. We do not advise this. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't advise this. But if you want to, that's your own individual choice. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're going to lose. Anyway, okay game against a really bad team. Um, Columbus is bad, and you beat them 2-1. You played decent. UPL still looks incredible. I think he is just pretty much the story of this team right now. I mean, even in this game, he allowed one goal, and you squeaked out a 2-1 victory, and the one goal he did allow wasn't really his fault at all. And then one of the goals the Sabres had was extremely lucky. So, I don't know. I mean, they, they played – okay again okay against a bad team i mean they're just not they're not good i guess i mean if this is what you're rolling out there against a bottom team you should be trying to win confidently handily if you think you're a decent team and they barely squeaked out a win against columbus who's just bad and upl kept him in at the whole game and looked incredible so 
right now to me the the story of this team is just UPL and he continues to be the story and he's continuing to play extremely good and I don't know what they're going to be able to do with him but he's really padding his stats for some kind of contract bump I don't think you're gonna need to pay him a ton but he's looked really good since January yeah, I won't talk much on this because we try to keep this right around the hour mark and we're right around that now. Um, UPL, unbelievable. Well, I think we saw the stat. Sabres have allowed the lowest goals in the league since January 1st, and uh, they still stink. So yeah, that tells you everything. Tage might be back. Well, he didn't put up any points. He actually looked real good in this game. Yoki and Dalin look like a great top pairing in this one. And then Krebs, I think he's been the talking point since they bumped him up in the, the lineup. Him with Benson and Paterka, very dangerous line. I've really, really liked his play style. And shocker, when you put a talented player around talented players, he actually is talented. When you stop putting him with Oposo and Gergensen, who are just a grinder line, he has some skill. Remember when he traded for him? I was like, he could be a 20 point six or it's 20 goals, 60 to 6 point player and that didn't happen and he it's never even come close and uh he's just been rotten on the fourth line but this is the moral of the story here phil and this is kind of like the culmination of the buffalo sabers uh season so far they won two games in a row and they're actually a point further back than when they started <laughs> they're actually 11 points back of a playoff spot now Love they've it. won two in a row and they're further back that's how this season goes, and that's why you can't stink and not win three games in a row. And as I'm saying this, they probably just won a game. Like, they probably on three games in a row, even though we've said it's not going to be possible. But, you know, Pittsburgh's got three games in hand, and they got two two points ahead of them. New York uh, Islanders, same games, four points back. Or, uh, Capitals, one game in hand, five points back. New Jersey, same games, six points back. Tampa Bay, oh, Buffalo's got two games in hand over Tampa Bay, but you're 11 points back. That's that's the season and a culmination is it, it's just funny. You win two games in a row and you fall one more point back of a playoff spot. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, like what they did with Krebs, I think that's just what the rest of the season needs to be. I mean, you yep. have to see what you're, you got. you're playing for next year. Start mixing things up, start trying to test things because you are doing nothing but trying to get some kind of decent finish to the season so you can roll it into next year and try to play better again i mean start mixing your lineups out i mean when trade deadline comes up which is kind of quickly coming up now i mean get rid of gergensen's we'll see what they're able to trade away probably not much but i mean start getting these young guys in start mixing it up just you're you're playing for next year you're trying to get some kind of momentum to finish the season so you can go into next year healthy and looking good and like you mentioned even tage coming back and looking more like himself from last year like that's good for next year but not not this year. Kevin Ams, do something. You I'll can wear do the shirt. On trade. Go do something. <laughs> <laughs> but Phil, we're running along. Anything else you want to add to this bandits centered episode? Or can we shut it down for a week and then just dread the Friday show of man, what if they lose? What if they lose to Vancouver? Yeah, no, I'm good. I knew this one was going to be long. There was a lot to digest in that Bandits Lots. game. Not just a loss, but there were a lot of new players Different and players, things yeah. that had to be talked about. So it was a really hefty episode to, to digest, and, and we did it. So we can just wrap it up. So if you want to sulk with us, this is a great episode for it. So on our next episode, which will come out on Friday, we got the Bandits Ro- or uh, Bandits Rochester, Bandits Vancouver matchup that will break down. That one takes place, I believe, on Saturday. I'll get you a full time when it actually happens next episode. Who cares right now? You can just sulk in the loss. And uh, any Sabres news. And then the salary cap actually went up in the NFL. Give Buffalo a little bit more room. Maybe we'll play a little game. A little game on uh, Friday, Phil, for uh, the lead up to the draft and free agency and uh, Buffalo Bills. Bomb. But uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if you can conquer my game or not. So thank you all for listening to another episode of the Buffalo Sports Collective. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at Buffalo Sports Collective and on X and Blue Sky at Buffalo Sports Co. Visit our website at buffalosportscollective.com. Phil's article is dropping on Tuesday for more details on the loss that Buffalo just took to Albany. My breakdowns come out on Thursday for the power rankings. Subscribe to our channel wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure you leave us a review on Apple and Spotify. Until next time, bye-bye.